Hello, young theologians. I'm finally getting around to what I promised last Wednesday, which was to talk more about theories of the atonement. And um, I want to go quickly back and just touch on the uh, first two that we did a little bit. And remember that in um, the story of God, I took the traditional three-fold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, uh, made king into prince. <clears throat> After all, Jesus is the son of the majesty on high. Uh, it's quite clear in the New Testament that um, all power and authority has been given to him. And it's pretty clear that the given by God. Jesus came and proclaimed the kingdom of God. All these reasons for why, um, while king is not an um, inappropriate title for Jesus, I think prince is probably a more precise one and has that alliterative value with prophet and priest. And then, of course, uh, I added to that threefold office, prophet, priest, prince, with um, a term or metaphor from that's uh, had a more more vitality in the Eastern Greek speaking tradition, that of presence. Again, though, these are not really locatable in any particular region or even time of Christianity. And um, all four of these certainly uh, exercise a role for, I would say all Christians everywhere of all times to some extent or another. So the first, Jesus as prophet. I did say in class that I I pressed a little too hard in, in the book, I think, to make the role of the prophet into reconciliation. Really, the, the prophet is all about proclamation. Uh, the prophet proclaims a message. You certainly could associate uh, revelation with the prophet, that is, the revealing of God's word or God's will for the people. And um, so that's really where I should have put the emphasis uh, with um, Jesus as prophet. How that works in theories of the atonement, again, uh, while, you know, the, the prophet, again, proclaims the word of God and generally proclaims the word or the uh, will or the message of God to a people that aren't necessarily happy to hear it, especially if the people in mind or in question have power, wealth, uh, privilege. Uh, the word of God almost inevitably addresses such people with um, a word of judgment and certainly a word of uh, responsibility to um, exercise their privilege in ways that will... Um, be a benefit to the uh, forgotten or the marginalized, the the weak within a society, uh, the little ones, the least of these. And so that message is often then um, not heard gladly and often becomes rejected. And this is actually a theme within the, the Gospels. I think I might have mentioned last Wednesday, There's there's great stuff in the synoptics about Jesus saying something to the effect that the blood of uh, righteous Abel all the way down to the blood of Zechariah, you know, has been spilled by uh, human beings. And, and certainly, especially Jesus is addressing himself to Israel. Not that Israel is any particularly more sinful than anybody else. The point really is that the prophets generally or at least often meet with a violent um, end. And so Jesus, so it is with Jesus as well, of course. And we have Jesus saying, I think in the Gospel of Luke, it's not fitting for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. And he's speaking about himself. So I, I do want to emphasize that Jesus certainly understood himself within the prophetic role. The way I mentioned in class that we could extend this a little bit um, is that with Jesus, it isn't simply uh, speech, although it is that. Uh, we also believe his, his life. And of course, all the prophets would often uh, enact uh, 
uh, or, or do prophetic actions of, of kinds that, that, in other words, their acts became prophetic messages. We find that with Hosea, Jeremiah, a lot of other prophets. Most scholars believe that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on, on the back of a donkey uh, in his triumphal entry, this is very much a prophetic act, as was um, entering into the temple square and, and cleaning out the money changers and the, uh, the animal, uh, those who were selling sacrificial animals in the outer courtyard. Uh, the outer courtyard was supposed to be an area where non-Jews, the Gentile people, could come to pray, to offer up their prayers and worship to the God of Israel. And uh, these uh, uh, convenience store people had set up their, their um, tables in the outer courtyard, which sort of desecrated uh, an area that was supposed to be set aside for the Gentiles. That at least is the way I read uh, Jesus' act, uh, based largely on the Gospel of Mark, uh, telling us that Jesus quoted one of the prophets um, saying, uh, have you not read that my house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations, that is all the peoples? And of course, within the Bible, that always implies uh, all the, the ethne are all the different nations or nationalities of the world, the, the specifically Gentile people. So I believe that Jesus was, was enacting a prophetic deed there that, of course, helped to seal his fate within the week. Um, and then we could even extend beyond there to say that in the role of prophet, even his crucifixion becomes a proclamation or a revelation of God. Um, I think particularly when he prays for those who have who are executing him, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Um, if we can understand that as a revelation of, of the merciful character and heart of God, then um, Jesus continues in that prophetic role, of course, on the cross itself. Then we move to um, the role of priest. And I, I admitted to you that I probably forced Anselm a little bit too much into that, uh, the metaphor of priest, Anselm's theory. Anselm's theory is found in his classic text, Why God Became Human. The Latin title is Cur Deus Homo. Uh, and it's a dialogue, set up as a dialogue, uh, written by Anselm that features Anselm the teacher and his student, I love his student's name, Bozo. B-O-S-O, -O, but I like to pronounce it like Bozo because this guy really kind of is one. He, of course, he's, maybe Anselm actually had a student by that name, but I'll tell you, Anselm makes himself look really good in this dialogue. And, and Bozo always seems to be setting him up, you know, putting the ball on the tee and Anselm hits these grand slams. And, you know, but that, Anselm wrote it, so why not? Um, now, I mentioned in class that the way that Anselm uh, presents Jesus is as the one who satisfies a debt. And I really want to, I want to again emphasize that. Now I'll just do this for a few minutes and end this first um, little lecture. Uh, the debt is the humanity's collective debt, and it is the debt of obedience, uh, the willing obedience of our lives to the will of God. We are heavily in arrears on that debt. We already know this one. Um, we, we owe a debt we cannot possibly pay. Anselm says that only God could possibly satisfy this debt, but it's a debt, debt that we owe to God. And he says, and this is why God became human. Uh, why the God human? For this reason. And I want to again really emphasize that um, in like fact, there's a place where, where Anselm says to Bozo, you have not yet really distinguished between the debt that Christ actually owed, which is a life of obedience. Um, you haven't distinguished that from the result of that life, which was his execution. And Anselm is quite careful to distinguish between these. 
that the execution of Jesus is the violence that he incurred upon himself that isn't in endemic or inherent to his obedience. His obedience is to live faithfully and to proclaim um, God's kingdom um, and God's will and God's righteousness uh, bravely and persistently. Pertinaciously, I believe, is the adverb he uses. Uh, pugnaciously might be a good one, too. But in any case, um, Anselm makes it quite clear that Jesus owes, what Jesus um, owes is the, or he doesn't owe it, but he takes on the debt that all of humanity owes to God, which is the willing obedience of our lives. And again, it's because he is so doggedly persistent and committed to divine righteousness that he incurred violence done to himself, torture and death. And Anselm talks about all of that quite well. And I think I quoted, oh, I think I, in fact, I know that in the story of God, I quoted some of that. Um, there might be another line or two that I want to make sure uh, that you've at least heard from Anselm, where he says, uh, he says, um, when Christ endured with kindly patience the sufferings, that is, the insults and injuries and death on the cross along with robbers, these sufferings which were inflicted on him because of the righteousness which, as we have said earlier, he was obediently maintaining. When he did this, he set an example to human beings the purpose of which was that people should not turn aside from the righteousness which they owe to God. And I wanted to make sure I covered this to note that while Anselm believes that Christ satisfied the debt of, of which is the willing obedience of our lives, he did not think that therefore uh, we were kind of off the hook, that the debt was satisfied and we could go on our merry way. He still assumes that people uh, owe righteousness to God and in, in one respect, then Anselm says, and Jesus, by his uh, courageous obedience, um, how does it say here? Um, he, he sets an example so that we should not turn aside from the calling upon us. Often this gets associated more with Abelard, this idea of Jesus setting an example. And so one of the things that I think it's important to see is that um, the differences between Anselm and Abelard are not quite so great as sometimes those differences are represented as being. 